I'm Ann Rieselbach, the League's Program Director. Welcome to the opening night of lectures by this year's Architectural League Prize winners. On behalf of the League, I'd like to thank the League Prize Committee, Evie Dimantopoulou, Cyrus Penaroyo, and Alison Van Glino, who are all past League Prize winners, for insightfully defining this year's timely competition theme, housekeeping, and for their selection of an additional members of the jury, Tatiana Bilbao, Peggy Deemer, Fritz Hag, and Victor Jones, who joined them for a truly substantive discussion during the first ever online League Prize jury. Tonight is just the first set of lectures by two of the six winners of the 2021 League Prize, and we hope that you can join us again next Tuesday and on June 29th to hear from the other winning firms. We also hope that you will visit a dynamic online installation of all of their work, much of it newly created, which will just launch today on the League's website joining already published profiles of the winners. All of the online material was created with the support of League staff members, Sarah Wessler, Ann Carlisle, Nanase Shirakawa, and in particular with the informed guidance of the League's program manager, Katerina Flaxman. A note on the graphic that you just saw, Britt Cobb and Michael Beirut of Pentagram once again designed the compelling competition graphics as well as adapting the design for the downloadable installation poster a way of tangibly getting the word out about the online and partially locally on-site installations. A network of past League Prize winners from across North America is helping to literally put the word and images out on the walls and online. All of this is made possible through the enthusiastic corporate sponsorship provided by Tischler & Son, Judlo, and Luminaire. Support is also provided by the Next Generation Fund, an alumni fund of the Architectural League's Emerging Voices and Architectural League Prize programs, and the J. Clausen Mills Fund of the Architectural League. League programs are also made possible in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council and the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature. And of course, through the commitment and support of the League's members and friends. We hope that you will join us in the coming weeks for this series and other League programs. Please check the League's website and sign up for our weekly newsletter to learn more about the League, including an extensive collection of online resources such as videos and essays documenting past programs and special projects from this year's American Roundtable to annual programs, competitions, and study projects. Evie will now introduce tonight's speakers, and after their presentations, she will join them in conversation and forward questions from the audience, so please post them in the Q&A section. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the first evening for the 2021 League Prize Lecture Series, and thank you, Anne, for, uh, Anne, for the introduction. Um, I'm Evie Diamantopoulou, and I had the pleasure and honor of serving in the Young Architects and Designers Committee together with Cyrus Fenerogia and Alison Van Cleaner. Uh, for the three of us, the task of devising a theme amidst all ongoing social, political, and ecological crisis, um, it seemed both deeply important and frankly, somewhat terrifying. Um, we, we put a call out into the world to housekeep. And um, it, within this call, we decidedly looked to practices that took on our collective complacency to the many issues um, that we face today and doing that with appropriate seriousness. Uh, under the theme of housekeeping, we thought we'd ask our fellow young architects to consider our relationship with um, notions of oversight and control and maintenance and responsibility, and also invisible layer, uh, labor and unspoken care. Uh, with some of these terms being more architectural uh, than others, and some of those being radically neglected. Uh, we also did see housework as a space coded with politics, as a space of uh, oppression in, in terms of gender and race and class. And we wanted to consider how these systems uh, may also reflect in our quite homogenous world. At the same time, we had a, a playful optimism in mind. Uh, you know, we thought maybe we can clean it up and there are people out there dedicated to cleaning it up. Uh, and we wanted to ask, what shall we keep, add, remove, disinfect, or trash forever from this discipline? Um, as a jury, and together with Tatiana Bilbao, Peggy Beamer, Fritz Hayes, and Victor Jones, uh, we felt that Jermaine, David Barnes, and Liz Galvez truly had distinct and important answers to these questions. Not only because we asked these questions, but both Jermaine and Liz uh, have a long-standing commitment to keeping house, 
they look to overturn, to expand, and to revise practice and our canons. Um, their desires we found really ingrained uh, in their respective bodies of work, in the research and experimentation. On that note, it is a pleasure uh, to introduce Liz Galvez and Jermaine David Barnes tonight. A few words um, for each in their order of appearance. Liz Galvez is the founder of Houston-based Office EG, a visiting critic at Weiss, and a former Muschenheim Fellow at Michigan Feldman College. She received a bachelor's degree in architectural studies from Arizona State and an MR from MIT, uh, concentrating on history theory and criticism. In her submission for the prize, uh, Liz wrote about the domestic, and I paraphrase her beautiful text here. Uh, she spoke to it as a site of gendered labor that sustains life, uh, a place to cook, to bathe, to clean, to care for the home, oneself and the other. And in her work, she takes on all these intimate kinds of domestic care, coupled with the largely anonymous and dry standards of professional care. Recipes and specifications and bathing and CDs and environmentalism uh, with performance software. Um, as a jury, we recognized in her work um, a certain kind of mastery to bring me together seemingly unglamorous parts of practice uh, together with an ethos that feels atmospheric and phenomenological. And in her disciplinary cooking uh, with merely air and water, speaking to our scarce resources, we saw a new kind of environmentalism. Uh, I'd like to quote one of the jurors without naming them, uh, who within her work, her baking of wicks and cooking of air, and her haiku-like strings of specs that produce exuberantly pleasurable bathrooms, uh, spoke about her work as that of a theorist, a hacker, and a poet. Um, Jermaine David Barnes directs Studio Barnes, founded in 2016 and based in Miami. He's an assistant professor uh, at the University of Miami, where he also serves as the director of the Community Housing and Identity Lab. He holds a bachelor's degree in architecture from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign uh, and an MR. In his submission for the prize, uh, Jermaine referred to housekeeping not as a chore, but as a ritual, an activity to be done again and again and be done collectively as a standing commitment and not as an exception within our day-to-day -day lives. And again, as a jury, we love that ethos uh, that he's reading reflected. And in looking closely throughout his submission, what we really loved most uh, was his determination to inform our disciplinary notions of the domestic through the carefully studied and imaginatively reproduced lens of the Black household. Um, as a jury, we found his long-standing fascination with the ports, uh, its elements and furnishings captivating and extraordinary. Seemingly a literal appendix to the more architectural thing that is the house, uh, Jermaine identifies the porch, I'll quote him here, as yielding the entanglements of social patterns, cohabitation in a sacred space for the safety or harm of black people. Uh, we appreciated his one-to-one -one remakes and many recontextualizations that are recurrent in his work. Um, and it felt like each piece from porches to stoops to beautifully crafted chairs or thrones uh, existed both autonomously uh, and also as a referential piece and as an original piece. Uh, and more importantly, I'll quote Jermaine again, uh, uh, in his work, he creates new architectural possibilities that emerge within investigations of Black domesticity. Uh, his work is with that urgent and important to share, study, and celebrate uh, through the platform of the architectural league. On a personal uh, note, I could not be more thrilled to be in conversation with two colleagues whose work uh, I admire wholeheartedly. Uh, welcome, Liz, and welcome, Jermaine. It's a pleasure to have you here today and to get to speak to both of you. And congratulations on both your prizes. Thank you. I would like to begin by expressing my gratitude to the Architectural League of New York, this year's selection committee, as well as Anne Rieselbach and Katharina Flaxman. Thank you to the Rice School of Architecture and Interim Dean John Kasbarian for supporting the installation. Importantly, 
This project could not be made possible without the collective effort and enthusiasm of our design and build team, Anna Cook, Yoon Koo, and Michelle Schneider. To Ali and Christine, thank you for making the in-person component of this project possible. Lastly, it has been a pleasure to meet the other winners, albeit from afar. I hope that we can meet in the near future. As a Mexican-American architect, writer, and educator, I live and exist between two countries, two social systems, and two cultures, two languages. This, in turn, produces a certain kind of knowledge and experience, asking one to hold multiple perspectives at once. This has influenced how I make sense of the world around me, as well as my approach to architectural, social, and environmental realities. What ties seemingly discrete and distant worlds together, for me, and something that I hold dear in both my research and teaching is a culture of making. Making ties us to other ways of knowing, living, and acting on the earth. My practice, research, and teaching entangle to pursue these questions through making, reading, and drawing. Office EG proposes examples of possible architectures. To process these ideas, making roughly translates to constructing, reading, to writing, and drawing, to imagining. This year's Architectural League Prize asked us to consider the theme of housekeeping. I approached this theme through the idea of home making. Today, I will talk of recipes, air, and water. A scattered showroom began from a preoccupation with everyday elements and institutions that govern architecture and its production. Speculative specification rethinks acts of product curation. The most seemingly expedient acts of architectural instruction making as moments for creative agency. Beginning with the architectural fixture product, the exhibition looked to the archive of domestic water use to both learn about bathroom design and to project possible futures. We designed and built a showroom of sorts, displaying full-scale bathroom fixtures and plumbing infrastructures, exposing the techniques or methods tucked within the wall cavity. There was an interest in challenging assumed water usage, starting with real parts and pieces and resolving mechanics to show alternate possibilities. Full bath radiates both water and thermal qualities running within its pipes onto the entirety of the room. The scale of its extensive radiant infrastructure allows for new domestic collectives and a return to thermal pleasures within our cleansing rituals. Washroom, a very wet room, is all about washing. Washing yourself, washing your dog, washing your feet, washing your butt, washing your toes, even washing together. A deluge of faucets and piping infrastructures provide various and varying spouts, sprinkles, and storms. A scattered showroom contained imaginaries for nine speculative bathrooms and is an ongoing project that investigates domestic hydrology. The medieval recipe in explicating the cooking process called for architecturally scaled climactic and ventilation interventions, implicating both the intellectual and the physical abilities of the cook. Ventilation recipes today cater not to domestic chefs, but rather to ventilation experts. 
Examining kitchen ventilation and related processes enables us to unpack our existence within and abounded by our very own cooked air. In fact, all of the major implements instrumentalize air movement and treatment within the kitchen. The linear kitchen. As the kitchen exhalate is expelled, its center line arranges wall-like vented smoky exhaust. Cooked air becomes more or less visible or smellable based on what's cooking. The width, duration, and wall thickness are directly related to the cooking activities. A pancake brunch may lead to a buttery, smoky, and doughy artifact. The C-shaped kitchen. The inverted layout allows for collectivity and as many cooks as needed to partake in cooking tasks. Encircling both the kitchen and the collective exhalate. Exhalation from each appliance collects towards a center, mixing, stewing, stirring, dissipating into the surrounding exterior air. Questions of building performance and construction logics are the background for much of my work. Immaterial Matters is an exploration on material and its environmental entanglements. The immaterial brick composed of soy wax and gravel aggregate responds to, records, and enables tempered air. An immaterial space considers entangled relationships between architecture and environment. We carefully measured ingredients, adding and mixing, ladling and pouring, baking and demolding. The main deliverable for the project is a cookbook which contains the recipe we used for wax and gravel aggregate brick making, as well as a series of reflections, accidents, and stories. We carefully learned about each aspect of making our own materials. We considered color, mixing techniques, and the details of the aggregate. After concocting our recipe, fabrication was delayed from the frigid winter to a sweltering summer. What ensued was an environmental disaster. We had seen our recipe in action, perfected it, and now nothing was working as previously described. And so it appears that, instead, we recognized that a rock in the winter is not the same as a rock in the summer, that unforeseen environmental factors were far more authoritative than we could have predicted. What we recognized is that it, the recipe, is in a continuous entanglement with its milieu. If understood as fulfilling basic necessities for life, the home represents the site of traditionally gendered labor dedicated to the sustenance of life. Yet, the processes mobilized point to the possibility of productively embedding the politics of building with the processes of domestic labor. 
and in doing so through careful, deliberate, and discreet acts that address global problems. Of recipes, air, and water points to an other narrative for architecture, one of ephemerality, lightness, and possibility. Through homekeeping, there is a possibility for recipes that care about things, its matters, and how these disperse into the world. They care for our air, water, and productively speculate to question established recipes The recipe is a tactic of creation, maintenance, and care with which the homekeeper is endowed. Through the instrumentalization of the recipe, immaterial matters cares about the craft of brick making, their materials, and those that will confront the repercussions of their creation. Recipes to follow care about things, its matters, and how these disperse into the world. We are breathing beings. Because of the importance of the atmosphere and its properties in ventilation, it may be well to devote a few words to the subject. The Earth's atmosphere is composed of 21% oxygen, 78% nitrogen, 0.9% argon, and 0.1% other gases. Air is our last common property. Forests act as the lungs of the earth. Tree respiration turns carbon dioxide into pure, clean oxygen. In this way, trees act as a conditioning and purification system for our air. Despite the standardization of wood, through the logics of dimensional lumber, each stud proves unique, manifesting agency in warp, buckling, splitting, knotting, texture, and color. To environ means to surround. Today, to surround translates as built enclosure. Enclosure makes it possible to exist within surrounding conditions that become unnoticeable. 
Enclosures remove the discomforts of our previous, presumably uncivilized life, once reliant on the Earth's temperament and geographic specificity. The envelope of a building is not merely a two-dimensional exterior surface. It is a three-dimensional transition space, a theater where the interactions between outdoor forces and indoor conditions occur. Insulation, resistance value, vapor barrier. Isolation rhetoric around the building envelope presents the extent of the building enclosure's task as one of separation. The narrative of the tight building, albeit to service increased energy efficiency, perpetuates our understanding of the envelope as a modern agent. That is, the building membrane materializes a separation of human culture from nature. Yet, there exists another, often overlooked, narrative. A plethora of pipes and flues penetrate the purity of either, if not both, edges of the building enclosure. These being often represented as unpunctured, pure, thick black lines enclosing space. Favorable atmospheres are defined through 1. A membrane or enclosure which serves to delineate environments and 2. Mechanical technologies which manage and act upon the atmosphere itself. A rereading of the building envelope as transgressive, thereby resists narratives of our increased separation and isolation from an exterior towards an already being with, highlighting the beneficial hybridity of our so-called interior atmospheres. Seven envelope transgressions work towards looser conclusions. Of envelopes and air locates literal holes in the building membrane by focusing on existing processes of building breathability. To ask if building tightness and increased separation from an exterior are not actually counterintuitive towards defining more radical and environmental ways of being in our buildings. Hello everyone, my name is Jermaine David Barnes. Uh, thank you all for joining this evening to see my lecture as a part of the 2021 Architectural League Prize. Uh, I want to thank the Architectural League for selecting me 
and allowing me to be amongst uh, the annals of many other amazing and wonderful practices, uh, especially the other five that complete my cohort. So um, this is gonna be a bit different than ones you've seen in the past, uh, partly because I'll sort of be taking you through a trajectory of how architecture has influenced me in the work that I do. And then at the end, we will be doing a live screening of the film that I commissioned specifically for this year's exhibition. So typically uh, we design something or we build something or we bring in other work like in the past, but this year I thought it would be very interesting and appropriate to make a movie that essentially shows the work that I do and highlights and celebrates um, the amazingness that is blackness. And um, I hope it brings you as much joy and delight as it brings me. So in the beginning, I will go through that trajectory. And at the end, we will go live to a screening of the film titled, You Can Always Come Home. So with that said, let's jump into the lecture. The Architecture League Prize 2021 Housekeeping I am Jermaine David Barnes of Studio Barnes, and this is my work. This presentation will be slightly unconventional in that I will be utilizing terminology not typically associated with architecture. Griot is such a term. Architecture's griot portends that architecture can be more than container. The Oxford Advanced American Dictionary defines griot as a person who sings or tells stories about the history and traditions of their people and community. With this framing of architecture as a vehicle for storytelling, my presentation will be divided into three sections that fall in line with this year's theme of housekeeping. First is the dirty laundry of architecture as a discipline. Second, the front porch work of my practice and how my research agenda fuels the practice and vice versa. And third, we'll go live to a screening of a film I commissioned specifically for this year's online exhibition titled, You Can Always Come Home. As I mentioned before, this presentation will be slightly unconventional. Unlike many of the previous League Prize winners, you will be witnessing my own intimate relationship with architecture and how I got to this point in my career. Missing Narratives. We begin the Missing Narrative section in Chicago, my birthplace and the city that forged my relationship with architecture. I was born in the Garfield Park area of Chicago on the far west side. Due to my accelerated learning skills, my parents enrolled me in an advanced elementary school, which subsequently led me to an elite high school. You can tell by the proximity of each institution when measured with my own residence, my daily commute for 13 years involved much exposure to the massive architecture environment of Chicago. My own residential neighborhood was filled with the Chicago two flat, a local vernacular unique to the working class identity of the second city. Both blighted and robust, these historic structures were drastically different than the immediate vicinity of Edison Gifted Center and Walter Payton College Prep. 6 a.m. yellow school bus rides to Edison Park often involved changing housing density and residential typologies. And later, Chicago Transit Authority bus rides would teach me of scale and the rate at which the city goes vertical. I was born into architecture. I witnessed as many different machinations. I possess a bachelor's of science in architecture. This non-professional degree would provide me with the technical knowledge coupled with my own lived experience. Our intro to architecture course will present many examples of buildings I have witnessed personally. The Hancock Building and the Sears Tower, I will never call it the Willis Tower, are iconic structures that all students must commit to memory. While this is admirable as a proud Chicagoan, I was devoid of towers by black authors. Which is most confusing because if one references the history of this country, we know that black bodies built this nation. After Brazil, no country enslaved more black bodies than the United States of America. As I progressed through my undergraduate education, my survey of architectural history continued. Historic monuments from antiquity referenced the Roman Colosseum and St. Peter's Basilica as buildings to memorize. 
classical architecture, which will later be a foundational component of colonial and imperial dominance, always ignored the contributions of non-white constructors. However, Sinclair Bell, Rome Prize Fellow and Scholar, presents to us the presence of enslaved people critical to the success of the Roman Empire. It's almost as if the continent of Africa was erased from architectural practice, history, and theory. The world's second largest continent with the second largest population was eerily absent from my disciplinary lessons. Self-narratives. After a short professional stint in Cape Town, South Africa, I would attend graduate school for architecture in Los Angeles, California at Woodbury University. Having completed six years of architecture education without ever having a black TA, black juror, black administrator, or black professor, my thesis winning project, Symbiotic Territories of Architectural Investigations of Community, Race, and Identity, will be the proposal that created my architectural agenda of utilizing architecture to tell stories, architecture as Greedo. And on this slide, you see the titles of each of these articles are actually titles that were born from various critiques I got throughout the entire thesis year. Things were said to me about my proposals, such as this would never happen in my backyard, finders keepers, and that you live in a divided city. There were also numerous times where I had to challenge my own thesis jury to get them to understand the ways in which the built environment has affected me and the ways in which that they can never begin to understand the ways in which a black person deals with architecture, urban planning, landscape, et cetera. So each one of these articles that are within the newspaper that I wrote tangent to the actual architectural design were literally critiques of those conversations and the things that I wish I was able to express in my project that I understood that architecture at large wouldn't be receptive to. After acquiring my professional degree in architecture, where I successfully defended my metaphorical connection between building and identity, I was awarded a grand foundation grant titled Sacred Stoops, Typological Studies of Black Congregation Spaces, which examines the porch and its ability to be a lens for issues surrounding race and the built environment. I wanted to test my capacity to use architecture to tell the story of my paternal family's migration from Mississippi and my maternal family's migration from Arkansas and many other Black Americans whose narratives were woefully absent from architecture. The grant that I received allowed me to visit five cities, Houston, Texas, Atlanta, Georgia, Detroit, Michigan, Chicago, Illinois, Washington, DC, to trace the spatial lineage of the porch, the rituals of the porch, and to test how much an architecture could be a container and the importance of that container or the importance of the inhabitants within that container. This research took me to Western Africa, to the TK, to the Combat, which are housing typologies that predate what we see as the American shotgun home, one of the very few identifiable um, components that signify African diasporic influence into American architecture. And from that yielded a lot of work around the porch which I would continue to, to work through. Um, one of the most important and liberating things about this project and this trajectory was beginning to understand the commonalities amongst the diaspora and begin to see that the historic legacies that a lot of these people have passed down and the ways in which I'm just merely repeating the same uh, rituals as my great grandparents, great, great grandparents and many others who identify as black. As I began to go around the cities, such as Chicago, Washington, DC, and Detroit, I began to document many of the porches that I, I visualized and saw to find the spatial language and understand what was important about each of these locations, the architecture, the typologies, et cetera. And while Sacred Stoops began as a research proposal, it bore physical fruit. The Sacred Stoops installation was the first completed project that resulted from this research agenda. 
This is located at Brickell City Center or was located at Brickell City Center. And the importance of this proposal was that all of the porch chairs that are within the installation are actually sourced from various black neighborhoods across Miami. It was a way of me bringing a lot of the culture from these underrepresented neighborhoods into a location where many feel they're not welcome or allowed to go. Um, a very expensive uh, sort of interior architectural mall, Brooklyn City Center. The idea was to create two very different porch conditions um, that will allow people to sit and hang and commune and do all of these things that we do on the porch um, and then translate that spatially uh, using chairs, scaffold, and other sort of innocuous materials. As I continued to create a body of work around the porch, I was approached to be the exhibition designer for Broward County's new Sistrum exhibition. The curator sought a design that would tell a shared black history of the porch and its role. So I started with the shotgun house typology, which is very common within this historic Broward neighborhood of Sistrunk, and then redistributed those spaces within the very small gallery. As you can see, the unfolded plywood is the same building materials of those that exist in the neighborhood, which then create spaces and rooms that the exhibition lives in. Cloth sway on the porch, chairs sit in the living room. You can also see the historic images that tell uh, a missing legacy of this important area in Broward County in South Florida. And while designing the exhibition, I was also asked to design a gathering space, something that, be, that could be symbolic for the exhibition. And so I started with these ritual images of blackness here in Miami and Bahamian and Caribbean culture, the Junkanoo band, the crown, the garb, the colors, the excitement, the celebration. And from that came a series of chairs that also referenced the same history. These chairs, which act as crowns, which acts as thrones, um, really talk about the importance of hair, about the importance of identity, about the importance of culture, and they have been pivotal um, to, to beginning to understand how design can reflect identity within my practice. The most current iteration of this work was recently on display at the Museum of Modern Art in New York as a part of the Historic Reconstructions exhibition. My project, A Spectrum of Blackness, uses the porch in the kitchen to tell stories of Miami's rich diasporic legacy. So this is the full installation, which some of you may have seen um, before the exhibition was unfortunately taken down after three months. Uh, the most important components of, of the exhibition that um, I provided are 12 collages, an exploded kitchen diagram, a map of Black Miami, and this physical installation which I like to call the diasporic spice wall, which explains the ways in which these ethnicities overlap and the ways in which they are different. Um, I'm calling out two of my personal favorite collages within the series. The one on the left speaks to the legacy of Black Miami's um, inability to access water, inability to access the beach, unless they were actual workers or in the service industry. On the right, uh, this is a young girl getting her hair braided in the kitchen um, as someone who is from a family filled with amazing black women. It is a sight that I have seen quite often um, and it is one that brings immense joy and relatability to my work. These two images are the various spices. Um, I like to bring a lot of fun into the work that I do. And so each ethnicity and their six ethnicities has one set of core spices which are things you find in most of the dishes that they create. And there's also the specialty spices. And those specialty spices reference the times in which they are used and the reasons for which they are used. Uh, in the African-American row, there's some um, Louisiana hot sauce and it, it literally says, yes, hot sauce is a spice. So with that said, 
I would like to thank you for following me along to this point. Now we go live so that we can show the film premiere. Hi everyone, uh, thank you all for joining so far. Um, allow me to cue this up for us and then you can see this amazing labor of love uh, that was born out of this um, prestigious award. And I have to make sure that I thank the Architectural League again um, for spurring this idea. And then also need to thank the film director, Juan Matos Wansi. You, you did an amazing job. And Monica Sorrell, the producer for the film. So I will share my screen now and I hope you all enjoy the film. Let the rhythmic chatter mid-range hums and high laughter lead you. Left slide stride into a cadence of knees knocking and hips synchronizing with trade winds. Slide right into the vestibule. Chiming between our house keys, back door key, mailbox key. Miss May came out to make sure I made it home all right. Hey there, I now. Unlock, twist the knob, open, walk in. Attention. School clothes still on back. Slide step to toss my book bag. Last step to sit cross leg. Pause. Pick up the controller, resume. Tension. Mom side eyes my entrance. She pulls away from the pot to remind me I have a job to do. Boy, if you don't get this mess off my floor and come give me a hug. I've been snapping peas since this morning soaked my greens and baptized my chicken in vinegar and lemons. Don't go turn it on that TV before you come into this kitchen. Wrap your hands around my abdomen. Try some of these beans. Make sure there's enough salt in them. You smell like outside. Are you tracking dirt all over my floor? You know this was my grandmother's rug. Haven't I told you before? You take years off your life when you don't listen to your mama. Your mama, your mama, your mama. Wash your hands and put some more tissue in the bathroom from the hallway closet. Pull out the gold tablecloth. Grab five dollars for a watermelon out my wallet. I pounced up with no question above my crown and followed the sweet noise of bursting bubbles. I slid right to the porch. The commute was interrupted by a knuckle sandwich from my uncle. Stopped by laughter and leave my baby alone. I proceeded macho. Slide, stride, strike, step. Outside. The minute I dabbed the group up, I cursed sailor like. Bagged on the people they loved most. Took notes, left the crowd with no one noticing, made it right and lost my way. Stuck my nose in business where it didn't belong. A staircase, overcooked sidewalk and alleyway. Familiar places you describe vividly as unsafe, I jumped off the porch but left your directions. My child, built from crabgrass and concrete. You are constructed of things that can't die, so I won't let you. Pick up your feet. Put one slide in front of the other and follow the walk up to my porch. You ain't gonna be running in and out of my door. My protection works best when I can see you. 
find solitude in these walls. Just come home when I call. Come home after the street lights have come on, when the moths at night play a dangerous game with the porch light, come home. Sit down and sit up. Look at how we have made room for you. We watch you gather mangoes in your shirt, hover over fireworks and dance in the sprinklers, my child. Let me feed you. Field foods to fuel you. Never forget how you did backflips in my yard with no gloves and no guards. So, unlock, twist the knob, open, walk in, and remember your job. To kiss my cheek, hug me, keep my rug clean and steal a piece of cornbread when my back is turned. You were created on good intentions on prayers both exalted and silent. You can always come home. I'll be waiting for you right here on this porch. Oh, wow. Um, listen, Jermaine, uh, that was really wonderful. That was truly wonderful. Thank I you. Give um, me a minute to recollect myself. Uh, that was just deeply immersive and moving. Um, so, hi, and <laughs> thank you. Thanks for the great talks and thanks for the great uh, films today from both of you. Uh, once again, uh, I want to congratulate you on receiving this prize and among, of course, all your other great recognitions. And I did want to also take a minute to thank the Architectural League for bringing us together and their commitment to fostering and supporting all of our work and sort of conversations tonight and over the years. Uh, it really means the world and I imagine I speak for all of us uh, tonight. So. Um, I thought I would start our conversation today from a place quite obvious that is the home. And obviously your, your work comes from a different place and has different arguments in, in the way you conceive it and sort of materialize it. But I can't help but notice how in a, in a kind of unexpected and subversive way you both return to the home. And you don't go back to the home as you know the house as we know it, as the formal, the architectural, that sort of post and beam and detailed thing. But you really look to the immaterial, to, um, I'm still in German, your word, uh, rituals, and Liz, I'm going to call your stuff junk. <laughs> you know, everything we don't expect to talk about in a, in a house. And I think it's quite wonderful. And I, I was wondering if you can speak to that a little bit, just your relationship to domesticity and homes at large in your work. Liz, would you like to go first? Um, sure, I can jump in. So. I think um, one of the things that I find very compelling about architecture and that I try to, to pursue is, is working on architecture that I inhabit and um, the kinds of interventions that are necessary for, for these kinds of architecture. So um, I think I'm very interested in just quite conventional architectures, right? And like the kinds of guts and junk of, of these, as opposed to this more kind of um, pristine or inaccessible um, models of, of architecture. So I think that's really where um, many of the kind of initial um, ideas for how to, how to begin with the things, the things around us, the things around me, um, and I think, uh, I don't want to speak for Jermaine, but I think, you know, one of the things that um, I, I find really fascinating about, um, you know, the kind of chat and the, the, the collection of these videos is, uh, I think we, we both come from kind of outside of, um, of, uh, of a certain idea of what architecture is, is supposed to be. And so I, I find that really um, exciting. 
Yeah, I think I think that's pretty accurate. Um, the I mean, my entire presentation was about me feeling um, sort of absent within architecture and my identity absent within architecture, right? So when I saw the housekeeping um, sort of title, I was like, oh, this was made perfectly for me. Like, not only is it the work that I do, porches, kitchens, et cetera, but also if we're really talking about housekeeping, we can talk about the things that haven't been done um, the right way. But then once I started going down that path, I just sort of stopped and said, wait a minute, why do we always have to prop trauma and like sadness and stuff? Like, you know what? Can I just make a movie that just, just shows pure happiness, delight, joy, um, and really shows the ways in which the home is important to us and the home is important um, to, to Blackness in Miami. And so that's sort of what I went with, which is I know it's probably not normal and your typical architects or academics might scoff at the notion and think, well, this isn't fundamentally the way we approach architecture, to which I say that's part of the problem. And that is part of the reason why you don't see a lot of people like me in the field, because there's just one unilateral way to approach it. And a lot of times that's boring as hell. And I'm not a boring person. I, yeah, I, I, I can't help but agree. And I'll say that on our behalf and the Young Architects and Designers Committee, we, we thought so hard about this. You know, we thought who couldn't, you know, what kind of work were we not looking at 10 years ago? The, the world is changing and our paradigm needs to shift. And there has to be work out there that sort of pushes the boundaries of, you know, the beautiful houses and the towers and the monuments. And I, I think this idea of monumentality, again, in your work is, is something else that's shared, right? You, know, you, you make a monument of the porch, Germain, and at least you make a monument of the, the hidden stuff behind the wall and um, uh, sort of all these unexpected, uncelebrated and previously unglamorous things. Um, and I, I did want to tie our conversation a little bit to your point uh, to race and gender which I think lead, led both of your statements and your presentations tonight, uh, and how these sort of um, uh, shape your work and thinking within the discipline we're all right in. Yeah, if I can share a quick anecdote on that. Um, so, for example, when, when I was building uh, the, the bricks, uh, I was working in, in a fabrication lab and, and people would kind of walk through and there was this um, always this commentary that they look like food, they look like candy. And my um, kind of initial reaction was to reject that, was to, to be wary of, 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 of the feminine, of, of the woman coming into um, the fabrication lab. And I think when the project really kind of took off and matured. Um, I, I have a dear friend who kind of um, was uh, just bold enough to tell me like, this is who you are. Like, you know, what would happen if you lean into that narrative of it is like food, it degrades like food. What, you know, what is this kind of indoctrination that we've had to, to the heroic and the permanent? What if you use your, your actual perspective, right? Like there's a reason that you made a brick that looks like food. Like what is the, the kind of meaning of that? And so I also just have to maybe give a shout out here to um, like the, the people around me and uh, my friends who are so, so generous in, um, in, in giving me, you know, these amazing comments and critical feedback. I think that's important, right? Um... I mean, I think, I think we all have that moment and sort of keeping the thing with, with housekeeping uh, is sort of the, like the idea of the porch as a collective and the ways in which you create a community and that community then helps to survey the neighborhood, to help grow the neighborhood, grow the people within the neighborhood, the residents, everyone's a large family. And I know within my own career, my architectural family is massive and I lean on them a lot for, for a lot of support. And, and some of those who are really close to me within architecture, I won't say any names, but he knows who I'm talking about. I complain to him all the time about stuff. And I'll text him and I'll be like, hey, yo, like, why is this continuing to happen? Is my proposal too Black? Is my proposal too Black? And so one time he just said to me, he was like, yeah, it probably is. So what are you going to do about it? You going to cry? You going you gonna to stop being Black right now? You going to stop doing the work that you're doing? Or are you just going to do better work so that it doesn't matter that you're Black? And so I took it as a personal challenge. I was like, you know what, you're right. I can't sit here and whine about the stuff. This is the profession that I chose. Um, so I'm going to lean into it. And so all the work that I do is always trying to pay homage to the people around me who created this nurturing bubble 
so that I can be successful. And um, I, it was a joke from a colleague of mine, Mitch McEwen, when, uh, when, the, when the award was announced and it said Jermaine David Barnes. And so Mitch says to me, oh, I know you're famous now. You have a middle name. So I laughed. <laughs> and so I laughed and I was like, Mitch, like I've always had that middle name. And part of the reason why I started putting it on things is because I realized whenever I talk about my work, I always shout out my mom, like all the time. And I know my old man, my dad's probably always like, you know, there's two of us that did this stuff, right? Like, <laughs> without the both of us. And so I started including my middle name, which is my dad's first name, as a way to pay homage to him. So like all the stuff that I do is always like, how can I find a way to sort of bring all the people who got me here within the house that kept me safe to get to where I am right now in my career? It, yeah, and it, I, I love both of your responses and how sort of identity is central to your work and it's you know something we can speak about it, it's not you know someone in the past neither of us looks like the other one in this panel today and I know that makes me happy and optimistic in both of sort of the work we do and the sort of where we all come from and it's just truly important and I noticed this kind of tension in the language you both use as well you know I, I don't think we'll find any of your jargon in architecture books we won't find griot and we won't find you know weird what do you call it like weird spec uh, like you know the like products of like home detail products who finds that in an architecture book who finds griot you know it's so important I, I think of these places like the league of course like primarily on the one hand as a space for us to converse but also you know as a space that fosters younger students who you know, maybe look like some of us who maybe want to do work that uh, does not look a specific way, who want to uh, sort of include their identity in their own projects. And it, it's really wonderful to see you both here and hear you be so open and adamant about your place in this discipline and all of our places here. Um, I mean, and, and we're both, well, I, mean, I, can, I can only speak for myself in this regard, like even though I'm underrepresented within architecture, um, I am still pretty privileged in a lot of ways. And so that, that's not lost on me that there are still a lot of benefits that, that I maintain and have access to that others don't. And so that's the other part about sort of the accessibility of the work is so that some individuals that may not have the same accessibility can still have the same opportunities. Um, I want to ask you a slightly boring question, a very architectural one. Sure. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and it's a question about uh, both of you operating within the realm of the installation. So, you know, both of your work has, you know, it is both one to one, you know, neither of you is making model, neither of you is making drawings, like where you excel is, you know, in getting your hands dirty and making stuff. And you do that in, you know, real size, real life dimensions, and you do that in galleries, and you do that outdoors. And, you know, it, it's a very particular scale. And I wonder if, you know, for your respective projects, if it's circumstantial, if it is intentional, what are the hiccups and what are the opportunities that this scale has brought to your work? Liz, you want to go first again? <laughs> um, I'm happy to, but I don't want to uh, always go first. I'm happy to. I'm happy to jump in. Um, so, I mean, my my favorite kinds of questions are are the banal architectural <laughs> questions. If that wasn't um, clear from my presentation, um, yeah. Uh, sorry, I totally lost my my train of thought. <laughs> um, maybe I'm filling your gap because I keep meaning to say it and I forget to say it, uh, please use the Q&A. Uh, 115 of you, please chat with us and ask questions. Maybe. I can, maybe. I can, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me jump in so that way Liz can collect her thoughts. Yes. <laughs> so we can do that. So um, like, I like, I like to say that I have uh, sort of congruent practices, practices, right? Like I do real architecture, quote unquote, real architecture, yeah. right? Like, like uh, I've started in an architectural firm, design things. But what I was doing that I was also working for an artist, uh, Xavier Bayon. So I was like, I was doing both of those things. And then when I moved to Opalaka, I was doing urban scale projects. So like uh, at the scale of a neighborhood. So parks, uh, adaptive reuse, urban farming, a lot of stuff. And once I sort of left there and became Studio Barnes, like I have an interior gut remodel that's at like 75% completion. I'm in the design development phase of an ADU. And like, those are the things that are like your traditional architecture, but that's not the stuff that I find like extremely fun. That's not the stuff that, that sort of gets 
gets my blood pumping, that's the stuff that's more research driven. That's the stuff that's more personal. That's the stuff um, that's more about the identity and that's the porch stuff, that's the kitchen stuff. So a lot of times when I'm doing the installation things, people are like, oh, so like you don't do actual architecture, huh? I'm like, no, I do that stuff too. I'm like, but how many houses do you need to see? Like go to Pinterest. You can, you can look at this stuff on Instagram. You don't need me, go to dwell. But like how many of these cool chairs have you seen? How many times have you seen a porch made out of scaffold where the yoga balls are meant to represent the kitchen furniture you're not allowed to sit on when you're growing up in the South or in sort of lower class or middle class situations because you need to save that furniture because it's like a symbol of upward mobility and things it's like so I don't get that kind of discourse out of a single family home. And so like that's not the stuff I put in the portfolio to get going but when it's time to go for like a big project of course I have to put that stuff in there so they know oh this guy can't put together a construction document set. It's like yeah I can. It's like, waterproofing. Oh, <laughs> yeah exactly like it's it's boring to me man. Like there's, there's there's so many things that just I'm just like I don't want to do that. It's so boring. I'm not doing it. But what's uh what what's great about it, the installation as a game? Like what what is the excitement in sort of building real things in unlikely context? I could be wrong. I can fail. And that's and that's the thing, right? Like you can't fail with good architecture. <laughs> you get like, like that's the reason why we have insurance. Like you like errors and omissions exist so that we don't mess things up. But in the installation, I can just test things quickly at a one-to-one, one-to-one scale and either it works or it doesn't work. Right. And then it can be torn down and then move on to the next thing. So there's this there's this ability to fail that a lot of times underrepresented communities don't get the opportunity to do. It's like I have to be exceptional all the damn time. But in installations, I don't. I actually feel um, for me, the installation is actually a place where I think it's harder to fail. I think that there's um, part of this is you know, the architectural trajectory of like leaning in and figuring out your strengths and, and who you are. And I think for me, this has to do with the the ability to be nimble in, in the one-to-one -one installation scale. And so I think that I, I trust myself to be able to um, kind of make decisions on the fly that um, are are much harder to predict perhaps in, in a like 3D modeled environment or in a, a drawing environment. Uh, so I don't know, to me, like, um, I think I, I mentioned this in, in how I work, there's a way in which making and working and thinking with my hands to me is so much more effective and, and clear sometimes. And, and I, I sometimes wonder if it just has to do with um, uh, just, you know, growing up with two languages, I feel like I'm a little bit terrible at both. And so somehow just like making things in, in the real, like I, I don't need words to figure that out. And I think to another extent, it also just has to do with um, with the way in which I, I grew up. I think I, I grew up with, um, you know, people cooking things, um, making, you know, there's an art to making a, a tamale, right? There's a craft to that. And so I think from a young age, I, I had that craft instilled into me um, through this kind of um, collectivity of like um, women in, 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 in Mexico, just like making, making things. My, um, uh, my family, um, bakes and um, they they made um, always like handicrafts and, and things like that. And um, actually my um, my father um, worked throughout my entire childhood and still today in, in construction, right? So I was always around that. I was never around drawings. I was never around books. I was around material and stuff and people and people figuring things out however best they could and just making do. And, um, you know, I, I, I have that. Um, and, and then the other things, you know, you, you get through an education, but I, I think for me, like the, the thinking with my hands, I've, I've always had that. And so installation is, is great for that. Uh, and, and that's something that really drew me to both of your work in, in kind of being introduced to, to your projects to, to let's uh, through this process. And 
you know, I think we're, we're coming out of an era where, you know, drawings are fetishized, where people stay up all night to make beautiful drawings. And I, I feel like both of you passively resist that ethos. Like you both want to make things and put things out into the world. And I, I wonder what your relationship on the sort of flip side of the coin to drawing is in, in your practice. It's funny you say. No, not to say you had drawings; they were cool, but they were not the protagonist of your portfolios for either of you. But it's it's, it's funny you say that, Evie, because I'm literally the director of our of our undergrad drawing curriculum. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> like it's me. Like all 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 of the students basically go through me for all the drawing courses at the University of Miami. So it's like. I am I am the one that that creates the curriculum. I'm the one that comes up with the objectives, of course, with the help of the director um, of the entire undergrad program. But it's like I was hired at the school to do drawings and stuff. And then when it's time to do work, I very rarely ever have drawings. And my own thing is like when you make spaghetti a lot, you don't want to eat spaghetti. So it's like I do a lot of drawings. So I'm like, you know, I'm not putting it in my work. I knew that one way or another, I would find a way to mess this event up. <laughs> But uh, I, yeah, I, I think your drawings seem operative. They don't seem, you know, to be in the core of your work. Like the photographs are in the core of your work. This film, in my humble opinion, this film is in the core of your work. You know, the drawings are there because that's how we communicate. But yeah, they seem to have a sort of, to be under your practice and kind of, I'm going to stop with this point. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're you're absolutely right. I think for for me the the drawing is is operative. Um, I think that I um, I'm all for um, investigating. You know what kind of architecture are you? What kind of architect are you? I've definitely investigated like the um, the experimental uh, kind of visual as as the final product and again it's like about leaning in and, and figuring figuring out right i'm i'm not as nimble when it comes to um to these technologies as i as i am i think in in making things and so for me yes totally um you're you're on it uh the the drawing i think i i try to draw things to like 80 percent because from past experience i know that it doesn't really help to resolve it further because things just ha happen and come up and you forget to buy a material or it's the wrong size, then you have to kind of adapt. And so for me, there's like a, a value in, in clarifying the design and where I'm going representationally to a certain extent and then kind of um, figuring, out, figuring it out from there in real life. Um. That really reminds me of my beginnings in Greece, where you know everything is a tool line drawing, and people just <laughs> figure it out. It, 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 it's true and it's effective, and in many ways, it kind of you know pushes back to like our expertise and like the capital all architect. And um, I'm very happy we're having this conversation. Um, I'm looking at the time, and I'd like to open it up for the Q and A. But first, I wanted to give you a chance to maybe ask a question to each other if there is something you want to bring up that I haven't covered. Yeah, I do. I have, a, I have a question. Liz, it's been what three years since we since we got in Michigan? Two years? Two years? Three years? So. <laughs> One of the two. Yeah. So I met Liz on a review uh, at at Michigan, and she was uh, doing some cool work around the post office, right? That, that the students were designing. Um. No, it was a city hall. City hall. There but you it go. Was across the street from it was Kitty Corner from from a post office. So good memory. <laughs> Gotcha. So my, yeah. my question with regards to the work that you put in the portfolio and the sort of trajectory from, I believe, the bathroom at Michigan to now kitchens is the goal to sort of complete the entire home or <laughs> or is it or is it the spaces that are typically aligned with the female gender? Because bathrooms are a place typically seen as something that's clean in the kitchen somewhere that's typically man. Uh, or sort of occupied by a woman. So was that sort of some of the ideas behind that or it just happened to just be, I'm just gonna work my way through all the spaces in the living rooms next? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so yes, um, Jermaine actually was part of the final review for the first studio I ever taught um, full-time at um, the University of Michigan. So he's kind of been, <laughs> been there. <laughs> um, so, so thank you. Um, 
for, for remembering that and, and commenting on that. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, my work really stems from uh, building technologies and um, really I'm interested in, in how, in the, the kind of functioning of the home. But that trajectory kind of began with a, a kind of larger question, which has to do um, with, with the idea of, of like social constructs around the home. And so, for example, I, um, I'm very interested in uh, environmental issues and um, resource use utilization, right? Like how, how um, uh, societal norms uh, institute how we use a bathroom, how much water we might run, right? Like there's research about um, how much, uh, you know, an American home uses versus, um, for example, a, a home in, in India or whatnot, right? And so that's kind of where I, I jump in into thinking about how um, these building technologies or lifestyle uh, are um, able to kind of be, be questioned in in possible and like rational ways, and always with a kind of sense of sense of optimism. So, so there's a, um, I think not necessarily a desire to look at every single room within the house, um, although that's completely possible, right? Like, who says we have to sleep in the kinds of quarters that that we do? Might there be other ways to sleep or other kind of arrangements for for the home that could um, uh, provide uh, better futures for for our kind of moment and um, environmental, racial, all of this, right? Um, so there is that possibility. I think that the kind of um, desire to look at the bathroom and the kitchen is just that it has the most stuff in it that we usually have to draw, yet it is the least um, designed in my that's kind of where the, the critique originated. There's a kind of um, very clear recipe or, um, or definition for, for what a bathroom or a kitchen was. And so that's kind of where, um, where I jumped in so far, but um, yeah. <laughs> um, question for, for Jermaine. Um, to think about that for a second. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a requirement. Yeah, I just <laughs> wanted to give you both the chance. Also, I think this is um, such a, no, I think this is a, a great opportunity. I just want to make sure that I um, kind of utilize it to, to its um, fullest potential. I think that, you know, in a way, I, I feel that I, you know, I, I kind of look to you as more of, of a mentor. And so maybe I'm just going to ask you for <laughs> um, a, a kind of, you know, advice, not only for myself, but just, um, you know, for all of the young architects that are also um, kind of listening in and, and gleaning in. And maybe um, you can, if one question that I have is just like, how do you, how do you deal with, um, with struggle or or tension um, in the discipline and in in the work when um, you you know you have to kind of share your experience uh, and and bring like there's a a real need to kind of bring our um, experiences and our voices to the table but those are not always kind of ne necessarily understood or or welcome. And so that's, that's like a question that I that I have for myself, but I think many other young architects um, are are faced with. Um, I would great question. Uh, one of those sort of introspectives have to sort of check <laughs> life type questions. Um, I can I can honestly say to you, it's only because of my support system, and the advice that I would give a young student or a young practitioner or uh, someone else trying to find a way within this profession is you have to surround yourself with the right people. And, and I am fortunate enough to be a part of um, an architecture community full with amazing people who are funny as hell and will make fun of you when you do something, <laughs> you do something bad, but they'll pat you on the back when you succeed. And, and they will more importantly, say your name in rooms that you're not in, right? Because you can't, you can't advocate for yourself all the time. Somebody has to do it on your behalf. And sort of the, the way that we take it is that uh, we're a community 
And, and if that means it's us versus them, then it's us versus them. And when we'll, we'll see who comes out on top, right? Because people in marginalized communities have always been way more resourceful and way more innovative. And then the things that we create are then taken and repurposed and then given a different name. And it's like, nah, we actually came up with that first. Yours is a, a facsimile of what we came up with. So I can just honestly say that from, from the Mabel Wilson to the Jafari Allens to the Dr. Donette Francis to the Jennifer Bonners to like all of my mentors and all of my friends, the Brian Lees, the Tyle Wins, the Jerome Haverts, like all of those people are what allow me to, to do the things that I do because they're all excellent and brilliant. So like, I can't rest or else I'm like, I'm the friend who's, who's bringing up the rear because they're all like kicking ass. And I'm like, oh, okay, I didn't do work this week. But at the same time, they're the ones who make sure that there's a space for self-care and, and a space to sort of be happy and understand that everything isn't a rat race and everything isn't difficult or doesn't have to be difficult, even though the world tells us it's supposed to. So just find you the people, attach yourself to those people. And even if they tell you, I don't have time to be your mentor, if they said that, they can make the time because it took them time to actually say it. If they didn't have the time, they wouldn't have ever said it. They just would have ignored you. They would have never even responded. So I still mentors. I just take them. It's like, you know what? You can't get rid of me now. Sorry. You're stuck with me for the rest of your career. So be prepared to have me around all the time. Jermaine, you might be in trouble after this. <laughs> <laughs> so Jermaine, <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> Yeah. No, but it means the world. And I, it, to me, it's very specific to architecture in America that it really is generational, right? It, we're all collectively, we all collectively care for the same thing. And uh, so the variations of the same theme. And if we don't support and advise each other, there's no way to go forward. It's, mm -hmm. And it, it's funny to see the overlapping circles of, you know, Liz's peers and your peers and my peers and how you know, we are, we're all in conversation and a knowledge that you know one of us is not going to do better than the other we're just going to keep doing things and having fun and moving forward and shifting things as we can um i have two questions one uh, somehow ended up in our chat and the other is in the proper q a uh, it's jaffer kolb and christina borman asking more or less the same questions i'll try to merge them um from Christina, given your interest in architecture's capacity for storytelling, I'm it's for Jermaine. I'm interested in how you imagine your audience. You have described the difficulties of communicating your thesis work to committee members, uh, a particular type of audience. And this experience makes me wonder about architecture's ability as a medium to communicate stories to different groups. How does the question of audience inform your approach to storytelling as an architect grad? And I have one more uh, question to tack onto this. Um, what does narrative unlock in design uh, that other methods don't, as sketching, modeling, and building? Uh, can and should we be teaching this more uh, in the place of you know, phenomenology? Gotcha. Um, okay. A lot of times I say things, and then when I'm done saying it, I'm like, I hope I don't get in trouble for that. This is going to be another one of those one of those moments. I don't make. I don't do work. I don't make work. I don't try to create work for architects. I don't. I try to create work so that my mom, my dad, my sisters, my brothers, my nieces, and my nephews will understand what the hell I'm doing. That's why I make work for. Like, and if I do that and I'm successful, architects will get it because like you're trained to understand it. Why should I make work for a clientele that'll get it already and then remove all the people I care about so then it's not accessible to them? So all the work that I do, even the language, like I can use tons of massively large words like we're doing architecture reviews. But then what am I saying? Like, who am I talking to? The average person will know what the hell I'm talking about. So I would rather just be a regular person because I'm a regular person. So the work that I do and the stories that I tell are the stories of regular people and trying to get those out there so that we can remove this idea of exceptionalism and, and remove this idea of sort of like the singular person who's the greatest designer of all time. And they're the star of the show when it's a collective that does all the work, right? So. Everything that I do storytelling wise is, is for the everyday. It's so that a person can walk off the street and come into a museum or go into, a, go into an exhibition and understand what the hell they're looking at. As opposed to seeing them on the wall and like, I don't get it. And that's, that's how I always do it. And I think the best way to do that is through making things because everybody is used to making things, right? So um, I think Liz's, I mean, I think Liz's comment about her growing up 
with tactility and that informs her practice, um, I think that's the same thing, right? It's, it's easier to do it because it's tangible versus the speculative drawing or, this, or the speculative architecture that remains on the 2D flat surface of paper. And so that's just the way that I see it. Again, I don't know if I'm getting in trouble for that, for saying I don't make architects for architects, but I won the award already, Architecture League, so you can't take it back. Um, I'll follow up with a question for the ladies from Orale for Left. Uh, hello, Liz. Thank you for your presentation. I find the collection of work you presented fascinating. Um, I was especially struck by your focus on dematerializing and the hard and synthetic boundaries between exterior and interior spaces, or in the case of the bathroom project, cracking open and revealing what is otherwise invisible. Uh, in relation to the prompt provided by the league, uh, how do you see these boundaries contributing to the house as a tool for control and oppression? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, uh, thank you so much for, for the question. I think that um, I spoke a little bit to that uh, in, in response to Jermaine's question regarding uh, this idea of, of kind of societal norms, right? Like how, um, uh, how, these, how these shape the way that we interact with our spaces. And so, um, you know, really kind of breaking, breaking that uh, wide open is, um, uh, to look at these uh, kinds of invisible technologies, these invisible um, infrastructures, plumbing, right? Like no one, um, no one said that these things had had to be that way, right? And so, I feel that basically since like the 1950s, when mass uh, kind of suburbanization happened, we haven't really explored what what could be done, right? Like there was a uh, a, a striving towards standardization and a striving towards um, uh, uh, the, the replicable and the, the functional. And, and so like now I, I try to ask, okay, so if, if these things that we don't normally see, if we, if we can see them, can we start to, to think about them? Can we start to imagine with them? Can we um, start to, to speculate uh, and, and push, really push them forward? Um, and you know, again, I'm super preoccupied with um, just the state of our of our atmosphere, our our environment, right? And so, for me, one of the um, the major issues of um, things like climate change and, and energy usage is that we can't see these things, right? We can sometimes feel them, but for the most part, they're they're distant or they're too large to be seen or felt, or they they move at a kind of different time scale. And so, you know, part of the work is is striving for ways in which we can start to make these things um, seen, so that we can start to talk about them, right? So, um, uh, for example, with uh, with the wax, you know, like just I, you know, something that I I like to talk about with that project that is so dumb, like the idea that a rock in the summer and a rock in the winter are totally different. But somehow like that didn't really strike me until I like really um, kind of recognize that it's this kind of invisible change that that things go through based on of, like these invisible to our kind of human eye, uh, the, the kind of forces of, of the surroundings. And so I'm just super um, fascinated with with that. And, I think that's um, a little bit more where my academic research um, focuses, and I, I I do think it's at a, a earlier stage. But that's you know what excites me and, and what I hope to um, to find more answers to. I have a, a question uh, also from Mustafa Faruqi, uh, who I would say. Sort of sidebar, his drawings are the most exceptional and phantasmagorical drawings I've ever seen. I think they fall out of the like drawings are over category, it's like <laughs> drawings all over again. Um, and sorry, Mustafa, I didn't see your question earlier, but um, he says, I love how your films both wanted to tell stories, but both took on totally different voices. Uh, Jermaine's storyteller is like an older cousin or an uncle, and Lisa's uh, is a scientist or maybe a creepy bureaucrat. Uh, how does the idea of voice or character come up in your work that you make? Uh, and also, and then thank yous all around. Thank you so much. Um, I'll I'll jump in, Jermaine. Is that okay? <laughs> all right. So, I think that um, 
when I tell a story, um, I, I try to tell it to myself. <laughs> and so maybe um, like for me, narration and, and storytelling is um, really about kind of explaining the world um, carefully and slowly um, and reflectively over and over, like making making sense of of that. And, and so in that way, perhaps this is where my background in, in philosophy kind of <laughs> jumps in and is just like me trying to, to make sense of, of, of the world by like telling myself, what am I seeing? What am, how do I interpret the things that I'm seeing? And I don't know, I'm going to speculate that maybe this is how we each talk to ourselves, <laughs> which is kind of terrifying, but um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Mine is mine is um like story storytelling is is in my family and it's just something that that happens and uh, there's a sort of one upsmanship that happens which who can tell the funniest story or who can tell the, the the greatest reenactment of that story and so that's why a lot of the work that I do and the way that I, that I do that um, sort of takes on that tradition or I mean that ritual of how can I create um, some sort of narrative that other people want to come into. And then the other part of that comes from um, my like number one architecture mentor, uh, Jennifer Bonner, who won the League Prize uh, a couple years ago. The very first studio we ever did in grad school was all about narrative. And coming from my undergrad education, I was like, wait a minute, we can do this with architecture? Like, I didn't know this was possible. And she's like, yeah, so we're gonna do this. And so like I ended up making a fish farm with robots in a post-apocalyptic world. And I was like, wait, this is architecture? And she was like, do you think it is? And so from that point forward, I was like, oh, everything I do is gonna have narrative now, like everything, because this is the best way I can tell a story. And I can use architecture to tell a story. And that's where the whole griot connection comes from. So I was like, wait a minute, this isn't new. Like my people have been doing this for like hundreds of years. I'm just using architecture to do it. Whereas they've already been doing that. So. That's why in my lecture, I mentioned none of the stuff that I'm doing is, is new or like revolutionary. It's just been missing from the profession. So it seems new, like, but it's not. Um, I would say this is maybe a great, fantastic place to, and I'll, I'll say thanks for bringing the wisdom of your people to both of you. And thanks for your refreshing practice, your commitment, amazing talks today. And it was a blast to meet you both. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all so much for starting the conversation this week with showing us your just in incredible work and um, much of the both the videos can be viewed um, on the league's website. The lectures too will be archived um, soon. Um, please come back same time, same place, so to speak, next week um, for the next set of lectures by League Prize winners. And thank you all for attending tonight. Thank you so much.